In this video, we're going to look at an example of how to find a basis for the column space of a matrix. We're going to see if the theory that we built up in the previous video actually works. So once again, let's just review what that theory was. Let A be a matrix and R its reduced row echelon form. Now if R is the reduced row echelon form of A, that means that we can write A as some invertible matrix times R. Let's say that A equals E inverse times R. We saw that the pivot columns of R are going to be a basis for the column space of R. So once again, the pivot columns are just those columns containing a pivot or leading entry. We also proved that E inverse times V1 up to E inverse times VR are a basis for the column space of A. Now, this is nice because E inverse times V1, for example, is just going to be a column of A itself. So really what this item two is saying is that the columns of A corresponding to V1 through VR are going to be a basis for the column space of A. Now what that means is that if, say, V1 is the first column of R, then E inverse times V1 is going to be the first column of A, and so on. So if E inverse times V, uh, say, VR is the seventh column of R, then E inverse times VR is going to be the seventh column of A. So the way that we can find a basis for the column space of A is we just uh, look at its reduced row echelon form, then we see what the pivot columns are, and then we go back to A and look at the corresponding columns. And those should be a basis for the column space of A. So now let's see if this actually works. Let's take the matrix that we had in a previous example. So let's let A be the matrix 1, 2, 3, 5, 2, 4, 8, 12, and 3, 6, 7, 13. Okay, now I've already gone ahead and calculated the reduced row echelon form of A, so you can check that this is correct. It's going to be 1, 2, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 1, and the last row is all zeros. Okay, so now we see that R actually has two pivots. It's going to be this entry and this entry. So R has two pivot columns. So if we label the, the uh, columns of R, so let's call this R1, R3 are going to be our pivot columns, and then R2 and R4 are our free columns. Okay, so now we saw that the pivot columns of R should span the column space of R. So let's go ahead and explicitly write that out and see how we can express, for example, R2 as a linear combination of R1 and R3. Well, R2 is just going to be equal to, well, in this case, it's fairly simple. It's just 2 times R1. OK, and now uh, R4 is going to be equal to, it looks like, 2 times R1 plus R3. OK, so now I've written uh, the, co the columns of R as linear combinations of the pivot columns, R1 and R3. So now what the theory says is that the first column of A, let's call it A1, and the third column of A, A3, 
should span the column space of A, because these are the columns corresponding to pivot columns in R. So that means that we should be able to write the other columns of A, A2 and A4, as a linear combination of A1 and A3. Moreover, if you actually look at the proof, the coefficients in these linear combinations should be exactly the same as what is used here. So that means that A2, for example, should be equal to 2 times A1. Now let's see if that checks out. Uh, the first coordinate of A2 is 2, that's 2 times the first coordinate of A1. Similarly here, 4 is 2 times 2, and 6 is 2 times 3. So similarly, if we look at the fourth column of A, again the coefficients in the linear combination of A1 and A3 equaling A4 should be the same as what we have here. So, oops, that's saying that if we take 2 times A1 plus A3, that should be equal to A4. So now let's see if that checks out. Uh, 2 times A1 is 2 plus uh, A3. The first coordinate of A3 is 3, so that's 5. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 8 is 12. 2 times 3 is 6 plus 7 is 13. So indeed, that checks out. So if we take look at the pivot columns of R, look at the corresponding columns of A, they're going to span all the other columns of A, and moreover, the coefficients in those linear combinations uh, equaling the other columns of A, they're exactly the same as the coefficients uh, of the pivot columns of R to obtain the other columns of R. Okay, so now we've seen that A1 and A3 span the column space of A. Let's just go ahead and, for completeness sake, check that they're also linearly independent. Okay, so to do that, let me just write a matrix whose columns are these two columns, A1 and A3. Okay, so uh, call this a matrix, let's say, B. And now we just want to check that the equation Bx equals the all zero vector has a unique solution, right? That it only has the trivial solution. If we do that, then we know that the columns of B are linearly independent. So to see that, let's just go ahead and do a couple steps of Gaussian elimination here. So let me multiply the first row by minus two and add it to the second row. That will give me this and multiply the first row by minus 3 and add that to the third row. So that will give me this. And then go ahead and add the second row to the third row. And now we're in row echelon form. And we see that indeed in row echelon form we have two leading entries. So therefore this matrix has no free columns and the equation bx equals zero does have a unique solution. So our theory checks out. Now we've seen how to find a basis for the column space of A, moreover using vectors that themselves are columns of A.